All right, well, we are gonna go ahead and get started. So thanks so much for joining us. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. My name's Laura, I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. Welcome back to our Career Dives, Live Conversations in Marine Science series. We are well on our way through this series. In fact, we only have two more left. So if you haven't registered for those, make sure you do so. And we'll be linking all that stuff in the, in the chat for you. But this summer series highlights the career tracks, interests, projects of our marine science professionals working at the Smithsonian Marine Station and the Ecosystems Exhibit. So while you guys are joining, if you still are, you can use the chat button to let us know where you're from, where you're joining us from. We said good morning to a few people already, but if you haven't done so, feel free to use the chat for that. Um, as everyone joins, I'd like to point out some of the features. If you're a returner, you might know, but if not, I'm gonna go over them for you. You can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, to ask questions from our guest. The Q&A button is the one with the two speech bubbles. Please submit your questions to the Q&A only. Please don't put them in the chat. It makes it a little bit easier for us to moderate and get to them. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, either throughout or at the end of our program as appropriate. Um, please be patient with us. We have had a lot of questions and we've been trying to get to all of them. If for some reason we don't get to your question and you still want to It wouldn't be a morning without technical difficulties. So um, <laughs> thanks for being patient with me this morning, gang. All right, I'm back. So let me find out where I was at. We were just about to get started, I think. So this program today is gonna be about 40 minutes. And without further ado, and without hopefully any more technical glitches, Let's go ahead and get started. So it is my esteemed joy to welcome Michelle Donahue, um, a, freelance science, a freelance science and technology journalist and communications expert. She's the CEO and owner at Michelle Z. Donahue Journalism and Communications. And she's a champion collaborator with the Smithsonian Marine Station. So today we're gonna learn how she incorporates marine science into her communication work and how she shares all the cool things that we do at the Marine Station and at the Ecosystems Exhibit. So welcome, Michelle. Hey there, thanks so much for having me here today. We're super thrilled to hear your story. I know you and I play a big role in communications and outreach, and I think it's really interesting to, to showcase all the communications and the writing that goes into all the science that we do here. So without, I guess, further ado, <laughs> it's a lot, right? A lot. <laughs> so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So Michelle, your career is a little bit different than some of the careers of our past guests. Can you tell me about how you found your passion for journalism and for communications and how does that translate to include marine science? Well, um, it's been a long and winding road. I guess that is my always takeaway is that there's been no direct path to where I am now. But um, how I found my way to journalism was in college. There was a moment, which I will get to, I guess, but um, there was a particular moment that kind of crystallized why, how I, I like I could see my future play out at that moment. Um, but if I could, can I go ahead and start sharing my screen? All right, cool. Let me share my screen. Go. All right, can you, there it is. Can you see it? Oops, Laura, can you see the slides? It's not full screen. Okay, hold on one second. I think. Michelle's using two monitors. Two monitors. All right, let me try this again. 
Give us one second, guys. We're going to get into it. Okay, full screen. Full screen. It is full screen. Let me pull it over. Dang it. <laughs> I did this exact same thing 15 minutes ago, and it's not working. I know. Out. We did practice, I swear. <laughs> Sometimes when you have the two different monitors, it'll it, like take one monitor and not the other one. Shoot. But don't worry. Uh, okay. Go ahead and share your screen and then just hit from sh slideshow. It's a technological morning. Okay, what do you see right now? So I see just the, the like the basic PowerPoint. If you, can you hit um, slideshow and then from beginning? Okay, perfect. How's that? All right, that didn't do that earlier. I did the exact same thing and I guess user error. Anyway, um, here we are. So cute kid picture, obligatory to start. Um, I was a, a reader from a very early age and I have to give a lot of credit to my mom because she worked a lot with me when I was teeny tiny. And um, by the time I hit kindergarten, I was reading full on books. And there were these two in particular that I remember. They got um, this packet or I guess the, the collection of Time Life Nature, Nature Library. And the two that I always went to were the universe and the fishes. And I just dug these up on the internet this morning. Um, and they do exist, they're real. It wasn't just a figment of my imagination, but I remember always flipping to these, this one particular place in the universe book. Um, it was pictures of um, the Martian surface taken by the Viking lander. It's like, that's amazing, you know, that we can send stuff to different planets and actually see the surface of other worlds. And so that really stuck in my mind. And then the fishes, just this undersea um, landscape that was so fantastical. And I was like, it's amazing that people can also go there. So these two also have really stuck out for me. Um, so I've always gravitated to the natural world and, you know, how things work and always had questions about what things are and how they work and you know, what kinds of questions people are asking to learn how everything works better. Um, one of my earliest field trips with my family, it was about six months old, I think, was to the Smithsonian. So I just wanted to bring this up because it's very, it's been a very circular process as it turns out. I just said it was not linear, but it's been circular in some ways. So just throw this ancient picture of the castle with ivy on it in there. Um, also grew up as part of a military family. So this was also a big influence in how I view the world and I guess the questions that I feel like I'm constantly asking because I was exposed at a very early age to different cultures, different languages, grew up speaking German, ended up studying in college a little bit. And it definitely changes the way you look at the world when you realize that it's not just your environment, it's not just your surroundings, but that there's other, other cultures out there and other values and it just kind of helps expand your mind. Um, went to high school in Germany. Here's me being cool at the super sweet skateboard ramps <laughs> at our high school. And um, there, were, there were two people at my high school who were really influential for me, um, my English teachers. So I always took a lot of math, I always took a lot of science, but my English teachers were really, they really encouraged me to, you know, it was okay to be a bookworm. It was okay to just absorb information and to be really curious about how the world worked. And so I give a lot of credit to my, um, my 10th grade English teacher, Mrs. Lana McWilliams, and my 12th grade English teacher, uh, and I'm nervous right now, so his name escapes me, unfortunately, Mr. Todd, uh, and they were really, really influential for me. So after high school, I went to Vanderbilt University, and I had been yearbook editor in high school, and so looking for something to do extracurricular, I went to the yearbook office because that's what I knew, and it turned out not to be my cup of tea at the college level, so I walked across the hallway to the newspaper, the Vanderbilt Hustler, since 1888. And friends were like, you write for the what? <laughs> it's like, the Vanderbilt Hustler. Um, so that was, I never left, you know, I, I, I walked in and people were like, well, what do you know? Do you have any journalism background? No. Um, I started out as a science major in college thinking that I would be a doctor. And like I said, in high school, I'd done a lot of science. and was actually offered um, a fairly healthy scholarship to pursue engineering. And it just didn't, I just didn't see myself doing it. It didn't seem like something that I would be good at. It didn't seem like something that would be safe for other people if I pursued it as a career. So I um, went to college, tried biology and chemistry, and it 
worked, but I was too slow. You know, there's the freshman weed out courses that you learn a lot and they're these huge courses and you have to really just know your stuff and you have to know it quick. And I just didn't have the chops for it at that time. So I switched my majors, my major to English because I'd always had this interest in writing. Um, and then at the newspaper, I was able to really start learning a different way of writing. Um, what else? Here's a little article I wrote in 2001. The big news at the time was that wireless came to campus. So I got to write all the hard hitting news. And um, this was my senior year, 2001. And at this point, I had had this experience that I mentioned earlier where I was sitting in class and every Thursday, people would get the newspaper and they would read it and kind of talk about what they heard in the paper. Well, I had a story in the paper that week about a parking lot that was scheduled to be, um, I guess they were going to pave over this lawn. And the campus, the Vanderbilt University campus, it's an urban campus. It's very leafy, it's very green, but there's not a whole lot of open space. And so students are really protective of their open space so they could, you know, go and lay and study or just be slugs or whatever. So when people read the story about this lawn that was going to be paved over, they started talking. They're like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe the university is going to let this go forward. And they got really aggravated about it. And, and the um, university ended up not paving over this lawn. And I had this, this realization. It's like, okay, it was this, it seemed like a silly little thing. But it, it turned out that people really cared about it and it mattered. You know, just seeing this little tiny story in the campus newspaper, it made, it made a difference to, to somebody's, a bunch of people's lives and the quality of life. Um, and then there was another moment during a homecoming parade that year where uh, there were all these floats that were going on all around the campus and the LGBTQ float, when it went down frat row, when people were throwing candy, when this float came by, um, people started throwing rocks. And the president of this organization came into the newspaper one day and was telling us about this. And we could not believe it. And so I said, I'll, you know, I'll take it on. I'll see if there's, if I can get the president of the frat to talk. And it went nowhere. It went back and forth. And then finally, uh, they got in touch with me. And I started talking to the guy. And he's like, you know, well, we can talk about this, but uh, none of it can be published. And I said, well, but this thing happened and it was wrong and and you should be held accountable for that. And he hung up the phone, we wrote a story about it because the frat wouldn't comment and I got um, hate mail. I had people sent me hate mail in my PO box, I've got a dead mouse. So that was fun and interesting. Um, but it actually was really instrumental in getting me my first job. So. Actually, this was also instrumental, being a typo queen. So if you guys hopefully can see the problem here. Yeah, if you guys can life. spot the typo, comment in the chat. <laughs> this is my life. I see typos on billboards. I see typos on menus. It's kind of irritating to friends and family. It's, but it's like a, it's a sickness. I can't help it. Elaine but, got it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this and the dead mouse helped me get my first job at a newspaper. And I should say, my senior year, I applied for job after job after job, dozens of jobs, and I collected rejection letters and no thanks, thanks but no thanks letters from editors and newsrooms all around the country. And I wish I'd saved them, but I had about, I think about 60 of them. I applied for jobs for six months at the end of my senior year and got this job in Reston, Virginia with the Times Community Newspapers kind of by chance. So it was through a friend. I called him up I said, hey, I'd love to come in for a tour of the newsroom. And this friend introduced me. And so I went in and sat down. And they're like, oh, you know, we don't have any jobs. And so we got to talking and I told them these stories. And they're like, you know, actually, we have a job on the copy desk that's coming open. And the copy desk is where you, you proofread all the newspapers. You make sure that there are no errors, that there are no commas and apostrophes in places where they shouldn't be. And so that's how I got my first job at a newspaper in 2001. Um, my first day as a reporter and with full health care insurance was September 11, 2001. That was my first day as a newspaper reporter. So it was uh, definitely, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. I spent a couple years at this newspaper. Um, and on the left, you'll see, this is just a, a copy of the front page. It's now out of business. It's since been, it was sold to the Washington Post group and it's been shut down um, in its former incarnation, but also on the right, I just got a bunch of clips. So I was able to write about uh, county government and 
rail development and this, this story that you can see here, bar raids prompt action. There was, they were arresting drunks in front of bars and it seemed like a sting to the community. And so it got all kinds of people again to come out of the woodwork and talk about the laws and the rules and how they're being enforced. And it, it prompted this whole community discussion about, um, well, a community discussion. So it brought a lot of people out to talk about whether or not this was working and if it was right and if any changes needed to be made. So again, kind of a, a cool example of a small, seemingly silly thing that led to a lot of people having a discussion about things that were going on in their community. And I should say that this is one of the free newspapers that shows up at the end of a driveway. So if you still have a community newspaper in your community, please read it. Please look into it. There are people who are, who are going out and they are sitting through these meetings and they're doing the hard work so that you all understand and know what's happening in your communities and how your tax dollars are being spent and how your laws are being made that affect you. So read your newspaper because it really matters. That's great advice. I think, you know, especially with with all of the things happening in our social and political landscape right now, we're, we live in an age of information. So there's really no reason for you to not have access to the information. Um, and like you said, you know, there's tons of people who slave away making these incredible um, news articles for us. And I think one of the things that sticks out to me about your, um, your story is that you, you don't really get as much positive feedback as you probably, as you probably should. You, I mean, you occasionally overhear um, people saying like, this is a really cool article, I never thought about it. And then you got so much hate mail and so many negative reviews. But I think, and I mentioned to you that this to you yesterday, out of every one hate mail that you received, there was probably five other people in the background who were like, felt very seen by what you wrote and really appreciated that you, that you had the courage to stand up and say like, this isn't right and it needs to be addressed. And I really admire that about you as well. Um, <laughs> well, so. the nice thing about the whole mouse incident was my creative writing workshop class. When they found out about it, they all made me cards, handmade cards, and they brought them all to class. And, you know, there were some onions. Um, it was just very touching. But yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't do this. You don't certainly don't do this job because you want feedback. Um, I would like feedback. Everybody loves feedback when they get it. Um, in journalism, they say, if, if nobody's happy, you're doing your job right. So um, it's nice to hear from people about how, you know, how it affects their lives, but you don't, you, don't, you don't hear it very often. I mean, the reason I was interested in doing this was because it seemed like it, it could make a difference that, you know, the free press is one of the, the pillars of, of our country. And I, was, I felt really privileged to be able to be part of that, and even in a tiny way as part of a tiny community newspaper outside of Washington, DC. Um, but yeah. Um, but again, journalism is struggling. There's a, there's a lot uh, that's going on in the media landscape right now. And that at the time when I was working for this newspaper back in 2003, that was the same. Their you know, pay is pretty bad. So buyer beware to anybody who's thinking about media and journalism. It's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough industry. You really have to love it. But after a couple of years, I left because there, there wasn't very much opportunity to move. Um, I had these, <laughs> I went on to be a dog walker and this is not me. I also did never, I never walked dozens of dogs at a time like this champion here. Um, I started teaching piano to kids at a local music store. And I also worked for a native plant nursery in Alexandria, Virginia. So these were all, you know, piecemeal jobs, but, um, Again, I got to learn a bunch of new stuff with the native plant nursery. I learned, I mean, pretty much everything there is to know about mid-Atlantic plants and ecosystems and got to meet some really cool people in the community. So I did that for a couple of years. And I think the take home message for sort of odd jobs is that you never know how some of this stuff is going to come back and benefit you in the future. So I've, I've questioned some of my decisions <laughs> throughout this process, but the stuff just keeps popping up. So it's really, I would encourage anybody to, you know, pursue your interests because they, they provide such a broad base. They, they contribute to a broad base that you can draw on over and over and over throughout the rest of your career. And you just never know where the stuff is going to pop up. So I went back to the newspaper for a little bit and then got poached away by an outfit called the Canadian Economic Press. I worked in the Treasury Department, um, the basement of this fine building here for about six months and watched the meltdown of the economy happen in 2008 from the inside. So that was super interesting. 
going all over DC, covering Congress, covering the Labor Department, covering, I mean, crazy economic news, and then got laid off, just like a lot of journalists do, because my company got shut down. It was he heavily leveraged by the housing industry that, that collapsed that year. So um, this was actually, I got laid off the day before I got married, so that was fun. Um, and then for the next couple of years, I did um, a lot of just random online work because I, I needed to keep doing something. But I had a new family and I was raising kids. And so it was kind of a step back and a reset. Um, and this is a book that I ended up editing at this, uh, during this um, part of my life. So this was really cool. I've got this copy of a book and editor credit, which is neat. And after my second child started to get a little older, you know, I, I was writing like gardening advice articles for eHow and writing little, just the most random stuff. This is, this is at the, the part, part of the internet where, or the point in the internet where content mills became a thing, where the internet was just looking for food, right? Looking for content. And there are these companies out there that would pay a pittance for little articles, but it paid some bills. And so that's what I did for a few years as I was raising children and eventually realized I need something else. So I started thinking about what I could do and started um, just looking around my own life for story ideas that I could use to pitch to magazines. And so when you pitch to magazines, you say, okay, I need, I have this idea. I think this is a cool thing. How can I make a story out of it? Find an editor, send him an idea. And I was fortunate enough that a couple editors picked up some of my stories. This one on the left is an oyster pea crab that um, I found in a batch of oysters that we got and this for scale with a nickel. And then on the right here, so the oyster pea crab uh, led to my first true magazine article in the Maryland Department of Natural Resources magazine. Um, it was unpaid, unfortunately. Also, for those of you who are thinking about writing, try not to, try not to be unpaid. So there's some things you just got to get clips for, but as much as possible, try and get paid something for your work. And it can be really tough starting out. But the one on the right here is my first paid, paid article. And this was in the, um, the American Gardener, which is the magazine for the National American Horticultural Society, excuse me. And when I got this article accepted, I walked out into my hallway and just had a meltdown. Like I couldn't believe that I could actually get paid some good money for this and, and write about stuff that I was really interested in and share something and get my grandmother's China published to boot. So that was pretty neat. And again, so I did this for a little while and was talking to my brother about it. And I said, you know, I, I'm not sure where I'm going still. And he said, you know, I heard this thing on NPR the other day about science writing internships. And you keep talking about science and you're so interested in the natural world and, and processes and you're always questioning things, and you're always reading. Well, he did a Google search and he found a science writing internship at the Smithsonian in the Office of Public Affairs. And so I applied and I was accepted and um, the whole world opened up from there. I got, uh, was a writer for a website called Smithsonian Insider, which just did anything and everything literally under the sun. And I had carte blanche to go all around the Smithsonian and talk to amazing people whose curiosity was just out of control. You know, people who were so passionate about the work that they did, scientists, curators, art specialists, conservationists, husbandry people. Uh, the article on the left here is the first article I ever wrote for Insider and it came out of the first scientific publication I ever read from front to back. And it's about a tapeworm, a new tapeworm that was discovered in the gut of a bird. And my, my editor, God bless him, John Barrett, handed me this paper. He's like, hey, there's this new tapeworm species. Why don't you write an article about it? And it didn't come together until I went to the, the curator's office. Anna Phillips. And her office was filled with invertebrates, you know, tapeworms. And we were talking about her favorite flatworms. And she said, I couldn't believe you have a favorite flatworm. And uh, jars of tapeworms, like all around her office. And it was just, I felt like I had finally found a home. You know, people who were super curious and people who just, they didn't do it because they wanted recognition. They did it because they were passionate about it. And I was like, man, I have a chance to pick these people's brains. And it is incredible. So this, this opportunity really opened up a lot of opportunities for me. This is an amazing, um, a diamond that came to the Smithsonian a couple years ago from an Alaskan mine where diamonds like this shouldn't exist. And this one was really special because it was really, it fluoresced really powerfully 
um, under UV and then when you turn off the light, it continued to glow. Like when you're holding it in daylight, it just emits this light. So they were trying to figure out what made it so special. And then, like I said, opened up a lot of opportunities. These are just pictures from around the institution. This is the castle's attic. Um, I started pitching more and more magazines. Um, was very fortunate to be able to write for a bunch of different organizations, including National Geographic, Smithsonian Magazine, um, the Clark Schools Magazine, which is the engineering school for the University of Maryland. A lot of work with bats for Bat Conservation International, and then some one-offs for a lot of different um, outlets. So Michelle, you have a really myriad background, yeah. which is like the coolest part about your story is that you have so much knowledge on so many topics because you had to investigate and just re like research for these articles and you got to run around the museum and see all these cool spaces. Like you guys, just for reference, that picture of that diamond is like something probably only a handful of people have you ever seen, let alone held. Um, and it's like in, in the back, in this small room, in this vault, in this other vault, you know? So Michelle has had like a lot of really cool experience because of this internship. If this is something that interests you, um, you can go to the Smithsonian Institution's Office of Fellowships and Internships and you can take a look at some of the opportunities they have there um, and just poke around and see if something feels right for you. Um, Michelle, something you didn't mention was that you were an intern at 30. So it's never too late to go, sorry, I didn't mean to steal that from you, but it's never too late to go back and try something new and just keep asking questions. Um, so I think you have a couple more sort of really cool experiences to share. And then I want you to maybe talk about how you came to the Smithsonian Marine Station. Sure. And I was actually older than 30, so I was a really old intern. Um, but it was, it was just a really good way. And I have to say, I'm really fortunate to have had the support to be able to do that. And I understand that's not an option for a lot of people um, and that you have to kind of cobble some things together to make it happen. So I definitely feel like it was a good, it was in a good, a good spot to be able to take advantage of it. So um, just a couple other, these are just some other things that people can see. Um, I collect my press passes and press badges and conference things and just some of the um, magazines that I've saved from the experiences. I also get a lot of people asking what my workstation looks like. So I just want to throw this in there. What, what's life like as a freelancer? You must go on location, so many cool places on assignment. It's actually, it's like, I do let my fingers do the walking. There's a lot of traveling from my desk and this is my desk here in Maryland. Um, and then I keep some touchstones, I call them, around my office that just like to look out for inspiration. This is the glamorous life of a freelancer, guys. If you work from home, <laughs> get cold in the winter time, uh, people taking pictures of me at home. That's always great. But yeah, like I said before, the Smithsonian opened up a lot of opportunities and I uh, was able to write for a bunch of different offices around the institution and eventually ended up coming down to the Marine Station. I pitched a story to my boss about the Marine Station because, uh, you know, he was saying, try and you know, dig up stories from places that people don't hear from very often. And so I, I learned about the Marine Station and saw that they had a science festival coming up. And so I suggested, why don't I go down and check it out? And he said, okay, sure, I'll go down and check it out. And um, the rest is history, I guess. Um, so the first time I was down, I wrote a story on the science festival. And a couple years later, um, the director, Valerie Paul, invited me to start writing for the station's um, newsletter and outreach, and that's where I am now. So that's a big part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis now. So uh, just, I guess I'll pause there if you have another question. Yeah, I was gonna say what's really cool is that you've been in science writing or in, in writing from basically, I hate to say it like this, but like the inception of the internet all the way through to now what we look at as like very heavy social media communications on um, all of those platforms and channels. And I think what's really cool is that, that you've been there for the whole journey and especially as a woman in this field, you know, you've got to experience the, the whole gambit of in press, in paper, in magazines to just transitioning to a lot of the work that you do with us is all digital and online. Yeah. And again, a lot of that, the media background has definitely helped. So a lot of what I do with the Marine Station, I'm, I'm still writing a lot, but I'm also 
uh, you know, just talking to people and, and building relationships and making connections and hunting down stories in lots of different forms. You know, there's print and there's words, but there's also, there's video and there's audio and there's social media and there's online and there's, you know, amalgamations of things that, that become stories. And there's, there's kind of this concern in science about how to communicate. You know, and this is something that pops up among professional science writers a lot, because many of them are from scientific backgrounds and not from media backgrounds or journalism backgrounds. But, you know, how do you how do you take information that's dense and complex and is presented in a way that's basically inaccessible to the lay public? How do you how does a scientist communicate that? You know, how does a scientist who has no communication training or understanding of how a media landscape works? take this very important and hard earned work and make sure that other people can can ex access it, but also understand why it's important, even if it doesn't, you know, even if there's no personal connection to that individual. So I feel really fortunate to be able to kind of have a foot in both worlds, you know, to be able to read science and scientific manuscripts, but also kind of understand how other people might perceive those the, that work is being important or relevant to them. So it's always kind of a, a, a tension there. Um, it's kind of, I mean, for me, it's highly interesting, but also it's a craft, you know, you, you keep, you keep honing it. Yeah. And it's a lot of work too, I think, because you do have to have, like you said, a foot in both worlds, you know, you have to be up to date on the science terminology and everything that's happening, like from a scientific perspective, and then also be able to communicate that effectively so that people can understand and like it's just you just have to me mesh both worlds to meet in the middle so that you know it's it's just be that bridge which is something i love about education as well so um we have a question um so isabel wants to know just really quickly about that um diamond it just a diamond that they found um and was really special because it phosph phosphoresced correct Yes, it was also, it wasn't supposed to be there. It was um, the diamonds that they were finding at this particular mine in Canada were all under a certain size. And so they had these filters to kind of filter out the, the chunks of rock that weren't diamonds. And I guess um, they turned off the machine one day and it was just sitting there. So like, oh, there's big diamonds in there. So, <laughs> but this one turned out to be really special. Uh, just because of its its unusual, I guess, um, molecular properties. So that's why it came to the Smithsonian because it, I guess somebody there noticed that it was unusual, A, in size and B, in behavior. So. Very cool. And also, I think I will share just a little fun fact about it in case you want to know more. It turned into a pair of earrings. Turned into a pair of earrings. And I, I believe that the mineral department at Natural History got a shard, like a leftover piece from the cutting so they could study it in more depth. I um, want to just mention really quickly before we move on, you guys are welcome to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we have been taking a few throughout, but we're happy to take some more at the end. We are kind of getting up on that 40 minute mark. So if you, you are welcome to ask your questions at any time, you don't need to save them for the end and we will get to them. Um, so please feel free to use your Q&A. And Michelle, tell us what all this stuff in buckets is. <laughs> so this was from a collecting trip uh, that went out, I can't remember the year, I think it was 2017. Um, and it was for a global genome initiative project, I believe. And if I'm getting the details wrong, Michael Boyle, please don't kill me. But they um, just were going all around the Indian River Lagoon, which is this long, large estuary that runs along the big chunk of the coast of Eastern Florida. And just turning over, uh, I think, I don't know what that was, a crab, like some kind of a, a pot for catching things. And they were flipping over floating docks and scraping stuff off of bridge pilings and just collecting anything and everything from everywhere they could to very characterize the, bio, the genetic biodiversity of the Indian River Lagoon. And so I, going along on that trip was really eye-opening for me, you know, because I'd mentioned earlier about the, the books that I would read as a kid and, and being really fascinated by these hidden worlds that, yes, we can access them, we can go to them. And now here, all of a sudden, I was in a place where I could actually 
literally touch this stuff and see it up close and ask questions about it. And um, as far as getting to marine science, like this is where I really started to realize that there is a lot, there's just, there's just so much there and, and being able to ask questions about it and tell stories about it and watch people do the process, like do the science, ask the questions, design the experiments and just chip away at the unknown. I mean, it blew me away, you know, just to have this opportunity to, to spend time with people around the station who are also passionate about what they do and, and working hard at what they do. And of course this year it's been much different with COVID. Um, so people aren't able to do as much of this right now as in, in previous years, but uh, they're still asking questions and they're still writing papers and I'm still bugging them for about, you know, the, thing, the things that they're working on and just trying to stay abreast of what's happening at the station, what people are interested in, what people are looking at. I think making everything, like transitioning a lot of our interactions and our communications to online has actually made it maybe I don't I hesitate to use the word easier for you to get in contact with us but I think it's made it more of like an acceptable thing because it used to be we would all meet for like all staff meetings in a conference room and then Michelle would just be a floating head and now when we have our meetings everyone's floating heads and you are there as well so um, I think it's made accessibility really a lot easier, but it still is, you know, you live up in the Maryland DC area and you are, you know, working mostly on Florida things. So it's like definitely uh, the remote work life balance. Yeah. But you know, it's kind of the nature of the internet. And I did want to mention that um, as far as the media landscape is concerned, you know, for people who are looking to get into this, um, there's more out there than ever before. There are more resources, there are more, there's more information, there's more, you know, access to information than ever before. And so this definitely, I couldn't, I couldn't do this job without that. But it's also a pitfall. You know, you have to be careful about what you're reading and you have to, you know, always be skeptical about everything pretty much. Like, what is it? Believe but verify? Trust but verify? Is that the quote? Reagan? Anyone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Showing my age. Um, but I don't know, I guess having the distance also can help put things into perspective. You know, it is frustrating not be able to, to be there all the time, just like as a freelancer working from home. Of course, I would love to travel constantly and go on location with people and see what they're doing right as they're doing it. But I am very fortunate to be able to ask questions and still get there every so often. Look at all these goofy dudes. Zach with the sea star. <laughs> so, so Michelle, we're getting up on that 40 minute mark and I just want to really quickly interject and then we'll, we'll get back to it because I think you have a little bit more time to spend with us today. Um, but for everyone who is joining us, if you do need to go, um, you know, feel free to do so. Next week's Discovery Dives registration link is in the chat. We're going to be um, interviewing Holly Sweat an ecologist here with us. Um, she's a marine ecologist at the Smithsonian Marine Station. And you can, like I said, find the registration links for our live streams and on the Facebook page. Um, we share the links every single Monday. If you follow us on Facebook at Smithsonian Marine Station and Ecosystems Exhibit. Um, but we'll keep taking questions. I've noticed a couple really good ones come through. So thank you guys for asking those. I want to let um, Michelle speak a little bit more about the station. And then I have a very cool question for her. So we got some more coming. So stick around if you can. If not, we'll hope to see you next week. So one thing I wanted to mention was about mentors. Um, in previous editions of this, you know, science mentors look a lot different, I think, than mentors in other professions. Um, and so my mentors have come and gone and they just pop up randomly. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Sherry Reed because uh, this woman, um, is incredible. And she was someone I didn't expect to find um, at the Marine Station. And so she became a very dear friend and was very encouraging of my interest in diving. And um, that was something that was supposed to also happen this year was more dive training, but got scuttled. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Sherry because she was 
the thing about freelancing and journalism is you, you find, you find people and they come, there's a lot of people that come through my, my week when I'm writing articles, you I'll interview scientists, I'll write an article and then off it goes. And I, I may never talk to them again. So I feel like it was a real privilege to be able to join the Marine Station and, and be in touch with this team so often. I feel like I found a family and Sherry was really the anchor of that. So I just wanted to recognize her. Yeah, I never got to meet Sherry, but her legacy lives on and she was an incredible, incredible woman who touched a lot of lives. So I think it's definitely, she, like I'm, I'm really sad I never got to meet her, but um, she, like I said, her legacy lives on. Great. You did a cool question. Hit me. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, so you were awarded a National Association of Science Writers Science and Society Journalism Award for one of your articles that got featured in the New York Times. Um, and that article was called In the Land of Quakes, Engineering a Future for a Church Made of Mud. What was the impact of your article? And how do you feel that science communicators can transcend like screen and paper and have like really significant impacts with their work? So this one, I mean, to answer the second, the second part of that question first, um, you know, telling the human story, I think really is the unexpected dimension of science. I think a lot of the, the, the science stories that speak to me the most are the ones that, you know, the science is the reason for the story, but the people are the, are the heart behind it. And it's one thing that I always, it drives me and I try to include that whenever possible. And certainly it's part of my research, like understanding people's motivations and their passions and, you know, the why they do it kind of gives you the reason for caring, right? Um, and this particular story was super cool. And again, gobsmacked by the award. Like it was amazing that that was, you know, a, a great thing. Um, but this story was amazing because again, I did it from home. I didn't do this I didn't go to the Andes for this. This is in South America and just learning about how important this church was. This is a, a church made of mud bricks, made of adobe, um, that was under a rest, in part of a restoration project run by the Getty Conservation Institute. And learning how, oh, well, okay. So to back up to the science part of this was uh, mud brick is one of the most common building materials in the world still. Something like 50% of Earth's population still live in earthen structures of some kind, but it's not characterized as an engineering material. Not like steel, not like concrete, not like glass. Uh, it was never, never tested, and its limits were never um, counted up. And so as part of this project, that, that process was done. And so it came, the, I guess the work can be used to make earthen structures safer around the world because many of them also occur in, in active seismic zones. So this story was cool because not only did it restore the heart of a community, but it, it gave them tools and the tools that they wanted, the tools that they asked for to, to you know, safeguard their cultural treasures, the heart of their community, but also as a and um, provided a knowledge base that really could benefit people all over the world. And just being able to share this, you know, crack the door into this part of the world for other people to help them understand. Again, like I got to live in Germany as a kid. I got to see different things and any, any military brat who's, who's spent time in another country or anybody who's lived in another place knows that life is different in other places, but that doesn't mean that it's any less important or valuable. And so just being able to kind of share how important this place and this material was to these people and the work that other people were doing on their behalf. Um, that was, a, it was a real privilege just to be able to tell that story. And I think what's really neat is that you didn't apply for that award. It just came as a result of something that you wrote. And, you know, it's again, one of those like small glimmers, I guess, of feedback, like you wrote this article because you felt really compelled and passionate about it. And then you were awarded, you know, this incredible honor and it just makes it, it just makes it, I guess it's like incredibly validating, but also like, again, you get a lot of feedback that you probably don't ever hear. People read your words and it helps them, like shifts their perspective and helps them understand in a new way. And I think, I love working with you because you are just 
such a wordsmith and like you just I'll give you like one little thing and you turn it into this maximum like maximized you know Instagram post or Facebook post or whatever and it's just like incredible if you guys don't know I basically feed Michelle a worm and she turns it into a butterfly so um <laughs> I love it and I think it's a really unique it's just it's just a super super skill that you have you know not everyone can can do that I I just spit worms and you have all these butterflies so um <laughs> I'd like to take some questions from the audience now because we've had a couple really good ones um so Sharon asks how did you juggle your career life with your family life? And also, when did you start diving? When did I start diving? Is that the second question? Um, last year I was certified for open water. So it's been a year now. Um, how do I juggle career and family? I mean, this is like the ongoing, the ongoing struggle. It's, it's easier now that my kids are older, but when they were young, I would literally get up at four in the morning and just to make time. This is actually, Laura, a story I wanted to tell you yesterday. Um, there's this movie called The Girl with the Pearl Earring. And it's about, ooh, Vermeer? Ah, I hope it's Vermeer. Anyway, a Dutch artist. And he is painting, he wants to paint this girl who's played by Scarlett Johansson. And he comes to her and says, I need you to be in my studio and at this time. And she's like a scullery maid, right? She's like, I have no time. And he says, make time. And so I realized that when my kids were little, that if I was ever going to get anything done, I had to make time. And that meant getting up at four in the morning for probably a couple of years until I would really establish myself, you know, working during nap times, working in the evenings, working whenever I could. Um, and then as a freelancer, also just working on weekends because international calls sometimes don't match up with the US work week. So just making time and, and sacrificing, I guess, sleep sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> So no work-life boundaries for you at the beginning. Nope. <laughs> Work is life. Um, I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong, but Eleanor wants to ask, um, you're a writer, but also a great speaker. Thanks to Zoom meetings and YouTube, in the future, do you think you'll be doing more speaking to explain the latest oceanographic developments? And I think this is a great question because we've got some cool things coming down the line. I certainly would love to participate in anything like that, so I hope to. And thank you for the vote of confidence. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> We're not going to release any details yet, but stay tuned. If you don't already, make sure you're following us on Facebook at Smithsonian Marine Station and Ecosystems Exhibit. We also have an incredible Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can find us at Smithsonian SMS, and you can read a lot of Michelle's incredible posts and what's happening with our science and our education um, and our aquarium there. And yeah, if you're not already following us, why? Why not? Why aren't you? Um, oh, I have to put a plug for our newsletter. Oh, yes. We have, we have a newsletter now, so subscribe to our newsletter. And you get to see all of the writing from the Marine Station there. And that's also contributions from people. So it's not just me. It's a bunch of people who are helping put that together, too. And this is a good time for me to mention, um, if you are curious about these things, um, Michelle has been kind enough to compile, and if you're also interested in science writing and getting more involved, um, Michelle has been kind enough to compile a list of resources, and um, I have all your emails, and I'll be sending you A, how to subscribe to our newsletter, and B, those resources, just in case you were more curious about them. Um, so stay tuned for that. Sometimes it bounces to junk, and I'm sorry if it does, but if you are interested, I wanted to just let you guys know that I would be sending that out to you. Um, we've got two more questions and then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you the all important question that everyone wants to know the answer to. Um, but Woody wants to know, when you write an article about the Marine Station, what do you do to consider your audience, their age, education level, et cetera? Hmm. Um, having access to the, to the Marine Station's social media accounts has really helped, to be honest. I mean, I, I tend to take a generalized approach, but for the, for the Marine Station, I try and split between practitioners, so scientists, and having something in there for them, but also making it accessible for people who don't know anything at all. So it's hard to split that, um, and I think it's uncommon for a scientific institution or organization to do that. You know, a lot of times when I, when I first came on as an intern, unfortunately, I was told that I needed to write to a fifth to eighth grade level. And that's, that's about the standard advice for anybody who's covering science for a lay audience. But I, I like to sprinkle some challenges in my 
in my materials always. I mean, I want it to be compelling and I want it to be interesting and I want it to tell a story, but I also want to stretch people's brains a little bit. And if that turns people off, then, hmm. but I think that, you know, if people, if people are looking, then they're gonna, they're gonna turn the page a little bit if they see something there that likes, that they like. So, um, as far as considering audience, I don't know. I just I mean, I hang out on Twitter sometimes and see what people are talking about. I look on Facebook and see what people are liking. Um, just kind of fly by the seat of my pants mostly, but it seems to work. <laughs> and if you're reading a science article or if you're reading our newsletter and you come across a word that you don't know, I mean, get on the Googs and look it up and see for yourself and um, you know, become a scientist and do what we all do. I mean, first thing I do is go to Google and figure out where is a good starting point. Let me say that first science paper that I mentioned writing a story about, the tapeworm paper, you should have seen the margin notes in that thing. You know, I was in a dictionary, I was online for like a day parsing that thing out. So it gets easier the, the more you do it. And I encourage anybody who's interested in science writing to like take a crack at a paper, you know, go to Google Scholar, do a search for something that interests you and download a manuscript and read it and see what you think. And you know, if you don't know something, look it up. It's more than just an abstract and a conclusion. It's more than just an abstract conclu conclusion. And, you know, go to lab pages and read about the scientists and see what else, what other work they're doing. I mean, it, it's this puzzle that you put together. You know, you, you pick up breadcrumbs and you, you follow trails and then you find some things that you're interested in. You're like, oh, there's people behind this. Well, what else do they do? And, you know, eventually a picture starts to emerge that makes sense beyond the academic jargon. So I think that's a good segue for our next question. And this will be the last one that we're able to take today, um, just for in the interest of time. But like I said before, if you had a question and it didn't get answered, please feel free to send us an email or you can reach out to us on any of our social media channels. But that email is smseducation, all one word, at si.edu. Um, the last question we're gonna take is from Jennifer, and I think it's a really good wrap up question. And Jennifer asks, what advice would you give to science teachers to help their students write narratively about content and science skills learned? Science teachers write narratively. Or maybe we can share the resources that um, you've compiled and there might be some. So, I mean, for me, it's all about storytelling, you know, like, when you read news, it's hard to see a story in it because like there's this journalistic style that is it's relaying information. But the cool thing about science is that there there can be stories in it. You know, there there can be um, it can just be it can be plain old like here's the process. Here's the results. Here are the conclusions. Here's why it matters. But you can also tell you can kind of dig a little bit deeper. And so if, if you're working with like, I don't know what your grade level would be, but say fifth grade. And you can talk about a study and you ask, well, why did they do this? Why are the scientists interested in this? What gaps are there that prompted them to start asking these questions? What's their personal interest in it? You know, I mean, these are the questions I ask because that's what makes the story, right? The human dimension. And so I think that you can, you can take any creative writing rubric you want and plug in some science pieces and you, you can get kids starting to think about science in that way. It doesn't, I, you know, this is kind of one of my frustrations with education is that things seem to be so siloed when, you know, you can use story, you can use science to tell stories um, through creative writing techniques. And I mean, that, that was my background. And so that's kind of my approach anyway. So I would encourage you to just, I don't know, find, find something that seems like it would lend itself well to telling a story and then pick it apart. I hope that answers the question. I'm not, I'm not an education specialist, so. <laughs> I think just asking people to write about science in a way that is a narrative and is, you know, is a little bit more subjective because it is subjective. You know, you have, we're all scientists, but we're all humans and we all have interests and we're three dimensional. And I think just asking people like, well, why does this story interest you? Um, and, you know, what is it about this paper that do you like or do you don't like, you know, just because someone writes a paper um, and you read it doesn't mean that you can't have issue with it or, um, you know, it's all, it's as much as we try to make it not subjective, I find that once you start poking holes in it, you'll find that there's, there's a lot of it. Um, and well, we talked about this the other day about like 
overly honest methods. Um, <laughs> you know, like people, we chose this dye because we chose it, but it's like, because it was the only one and we didn't have any budget to get a different dye, you know, it's just like stuff like that. And yeah. it's, it's interesting. Like I said, once you start like poking holes in it and looking closely, you can, you can start to see that. Well, and the elements themselves can be characters, you know, like, so the diamond, for example, was the star of its, of its show. You know, you tell, you can tell a story around the element under study. You can tell a story around the person who's doing the study. You can tell a story about the place where the story, where the, the work is being done. You can tell a story about the failures that happened on the way, you know, because science is iterative. And I, and I find this also to be just as fascinating as any results that come out of a study was that, oh man, you accidentally killed your entire sample. Eee. Like, let's talk about that, you know? It happens. <laughs> and, this is, and this is something that I, I feel is really lacking generally is an understanding that science isn't a fixed point. It isn't, it isn't final. You sure we have gravity that keeps us, you know, stuck to earth, but for the most part, science is iterative. You know, it's, it's, the pro it's the process of discovery. And that means sometimes saying that you screwed something up. That means saying that, well, that's what we used to know, but here's what we know better now. And so, you know, science communications, I feel like this is the whole purpose, not only communicating results, but communicating process. So I did want to add um, one more thing to people. Keep asking questions, folks, like keep reading, keep uh, putting yourself in places. You know, if you really want to do this, like walk into places, start asking questions, just reach out, um, hang out until you are, you know, you're where you're supposed to be, even if you weren't really supposed to be there to begin with. And I don't know, like if you're uncomfortable, you're, you're doing it right. That's really good advice, Michelle. Thank you so much for your time today. If you guys stuck on to the end, I also want to say thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the webinar with us today. Um, we'll do, since you're here, since you guys stuck around, we'll do the million dollar question. And I think you kind of addressed it already with, um, your comment about just if you're uncomfortable you're doing it right but the million dollar question we always get is um if you could have if you could leave our audience with just one thing that you know if it's like a final final piece of advice for people who are interested in science writing or that are interested in pursuing a similar career path in journalism or media what would that golden ticket of advice be um i can't do one you have to read you have to consume knowledge constantly. And I feel like that's a privilege. So read, 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 watch videos, pick stuff apart. Um, but also just don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, people say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but we're, we're made to feel like there are dumb questions constantly and just keep asking questions. You know, if you notice something, make a note of it, look it up. Like it's fine to check out Google and to look it up. So keep asking questions, keep being curious, read all the time and I don't know, just, you know, pursue, pursue something that interests you and you, I, I think you can't fail to be rewarded by it. I love that. And just keep, keep on keeping on. I think that's been, huh. you know, the advice we've heard quite a few times is show just, up and stick with it. Yep. Yeah. Show up and keep asking questions. Like if you have a question, if you have that question, probably 10 other people have that question, but they're just too shy or afraid to ask it. Um, so just ask it. That's my method. And I, do it all the time and all my friends can tell you that I will be the first one to be like, hey, I've got a question about that. Um, but anyway, this isn't about me, but thanks so much for joining us, guys. If you stuck around, like I said, we really appreciate you. This is available on Facebook and it'll be made available on YouTube after the fact. So you can always check out our recordings if you weren't able to stay for the whole thing or if you came in late. Um, if you enjoyed this program, please join us next week. I'll be interviewing Holly Sweat, a marine ecologist at the Smithsonian Marine Station, and she's got some really cool um, projects in benthic ecology, and I'm um, really excited to hear all about her work. So you can find the registration links for our live streams in the chat if you're joining us on Zoom, or you can find them on our Facebook page. And like I said, that's Smithsonian Marine Ecosystems, oh, sorry, Smithsonian Marine Station and Ecosystems Exhibit. I need to get another cup of coffee. Um, we share the links with you guys every single Monday. So make sure if you want to ask questions live, the best way to do that is to register for the Zooms. Um, we do sometimes get to the questions on Facebook, but the best way to do it live is by registering. Um, check the chat box because Yashira is going to be sharing those links with you guys. And like I said, if you had a question and it didn't get answered, if you think of one after the fact, you're always welcome to email us. And that email address is again in the chat. 
Um, so thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really enjoyed interviewing and talking with you this morning. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun and it was super fun and trippy to go back through this crazy career. So I hope other people, if you have questions, please reach out. I'm always happy to um, answer any specific questions anybody has. And be, look, be on the lookout for that email. Like I said, we're going to send you um, just a check in to ask you to subscribe to our newsletter and check out all the cool science that we've got coming out. And if you want to have a little bit more um, resources for science writing and for journalism. So um, that's all we got for you guys today. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Until next time.